Hello, Tirza. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to our platform. It is such a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. A true honor. I'm so excited to launch. Well, I, I want to say to everybody, welcome to this wonderful class that I, I am, I personally am so excited about. I'm, I'm, I am eager, eager for every single one of these classes, Wounds into Wisdom. And I have to tell you that once we put out our uh, videos on the class, the response from people was, it's like you have your, your finger on the pulse of how people feel about wounds, how they want to address wounds within themselves, the fact that you're providing such a language for them. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to you and tell you thank you again, and I'll see you at the end of class. Okay, great. Thank you. That was that was a painless introduction. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Welcome to you, friends, from whatever part of the world you are joining us from. I come to you from the foothills of the Rocky Mountains here in the United States in the state of Colorado. This was uh, originally the lands of Chief Naiwat, Chief Left Hand, the Southern Arapaho people, the Cheyenne and the Ute peoples. Uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you in this truly transformative time on planet Earth. And um, I'm going to say just a couple of preliminary words that this is strong medicine. This course that you're that we're all embarking on tonight or today, whenever you're listening to this in module one, I want you to um, to know that we're going to be spending a lot of time creating uh, a protective container so that we are very grounded, that we are not getting stuck. Uh, I want you to have a glass of water nearby or a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink, because we're going to be uh, flushing through and washing through lots of information. I'd love if you could have a notebook or a journal nearby because there'll be plenty of time for reflection. And I would really, truly, my, uh, my greatest wish is that this is material that is not just from the neck and up, but really is relevant, applies to you, to your life, to your family, to your lineage, wherever you hail from. Because all of us have wounds in our lineages, if not in our own lives and in the life of our family, then uh, above us, our ancestors lived through things that are sometimes unthinkable. So we're going to be doing some deep work and self-care is really, really important. Uh, if you're listening to this and you are needing a bio break or you're needing to stretch or walk around or take a break, please, please do. Uh, we are going to be pacing ourselves. And um, and with that, let's, let's go ahead and dive in and uh, take a look. Vince is my ally here. We're going to go right to that next slide. The first slide, yes, the next one. There we go. So welcome to the grand view. And by this, I mean the soul's view, the soul's view that this work provides that comes when we widen the aperture of our camera, the lens of our camera to include not only our world, but our ancestors' world and the lineages from which we came and all the influences that they still have upon our world. This is the, the big view where we begin to see ourselves as, a, as part of a great river, a river of love, of intention, of wisdom, and also the dams in that river, the blockages within that river, the unconscious historical patterns and traumas from generations ago that are still reverberating in all of us and what we can do about that. So I'm excited to be on this journey with you. Let me tell you some of what you can expect in each module of this course. Next slide. Every module will contain, when usually at the beginning, we're gonna be doing embodiment practices. And what does that mean? It means uh, little exercises that I'll guide you through to calm 
your nervous system to stabilize you uh, because the work of trauma healing can be intense, as I just said, and it requires that we be kind of chill, that we're untriggered, that we're in our parasympathetic nervous system. That means that we're uh, in the, the, the rest and digest zone. And um, this work will trigger us all. I have stories that I've told scores of times and they still trigger me because they're, they're such strong medicine. Um, so when we, we're gonna need tools to just come back into balance and open back up and relax. So a lot of relaxation. And by the end of this course, you're gonna have a treasure trove of, of uh, these kinds of self-regulation exercises and self-care. Um, we're always going to make an invocation to the unseen realms. This is a non-religious uh, salute to that which all the ancestors, to the teachers, the guides on the other side who are no longer embodied, but who are with us. And we want them on our side. We're going to have moments of self-reflection. That's why I would love for you to have a journal or a notebook handy. If also it's fine to just reflect with your eyes closed and just take a breath. We'll of course have a core teaching that's on the more didactic side. And we will always end the module with a guided meditation that incorporates the teachings and provides what I call a grist for the mill, uh, grist for our work between modules. And then we close with a conversation with me and my teacher and colleague, Carolyn. So let's start. Let's start by leaning back. And uh, Vince, you can come back to me. And uh, we'll start with leaning back into our seat. You can lie back if you would prefer. Whatever shape your body is in, whatever kind of seat you're on, take a moment right now to get present into present tense. We'll take a couple of breaths just to let the, the day go, what the traffic of the day, all the stimulation of the day, and relax, relax your body, your back body. This is uh, what the yogis call the ancestral body the posterior chain, uh, the back body is all those long muscles in the back. And we rest them back into the seat behind us. And if you would, please imagine now a little star or spark of light at the lowest part of your spine, the base of your spine, your sacral area, your tailbone area. Just imagine that you can close or soften your eyes, bring that to your mind's eye, way down there. And as you breathe in, picture this little star riding up your spine, like a little elevator carriage going up a shaft. And then down again on your out breath. Let's try that. Inhaling that little spark up and exhaling it down. Very restful, No, not, not a lot of effort here. And this little star, this little laser beam is shining and we are giving it the power to clear out stress and stuck energy, stagnant energy as it rises and falls. It's riding up the inside now of your, the anterior side of your, your actual bone, your, your bony spine behind your organs. You're raising it on your inhalation and it falls back down to your low back on the exhalation. And as it passes, uh, passes up, as you raise it up, it, notice that it's starting to illuminate the area that it's passing by. So inhaling, it shines its light behind your organs, behind your intestines, your reproductive organs, as it, you raise it up behind your lung and heart and let it relax down again. 
each time you breathe, it will do this on its own. Now that you've gotten it started, it will start to carve out a passageway up and down the inside of your spinal column. This is also called the Kundalini channel. You're relaxed as this sparkling energy just illuminates the back, through the back of your organs. Cleansing and energizing as it goes up and down. Beautiful. We're going to do one more set of long breaths, this time raising this spark all the way up to the midbrain, to the corpus callosum, that place right between the right and the left hemispheres. And imagine this spark illuminating your, your entire brain, clearing it out, illuminating it, relaxing, and opening your mind. Beautiful. With this feeling of opening, you can keep this breathing going or just relax and, and join me as we make an opening prayer. Opening to this river of light and life that streams through all of us. We recognize now the mysterious life force that called us into the world at this precise time to awaken and heal ourselves, to assist in this great tide of transformation that we're all living through. We call upon the sacred spirit of the land beneath us, wherever we are finding ourselves on planet earth right now and ask that our healing work bless this earth, bless her creatures, Bless creation. May it be for the good of all beings. And we call upon the well and the bright and the wise elders of all of our lineages. We come from all over the world. There are many lineages that are represented here. We call upon you, guiding spirits, teachers, sage women, righteous ones, ancestral guides, and angelic forces. We humbly face you now. We thank you for this opportunity to be here together on this wild mechanism that brings us together electronically and ask you to shine your wise spirit light, your guidance upon us as we embark upon this healing journey. And with the light open and streaming now, each of us, let's each of us ask that the wise and well teachers and ancestors and guides from our respective lineages be present with us. You can take this moment right now yourself, uh, wherever you are, in your home, wherever you're listening to this, to whisper or say out loud the names of those who are wise and well that you feel are loving guides, teachers who have passed, even historical figures who have passed, and definitely relatives who are on your team who may not be perfect, but they are, they are, you feel that they are loving and uh, backing you up. They're on your team. Please assist and bless this work. Bless this journey, protect us. P protect us from all the cynical, distracting, centrifugal energies that pull us away from what we know. Help us open channels for healing in ourselves, for ourselves, for our families, for the sake of our lineages. May our healing efforts go backwards and forwards for the sake of wholeness. And may every one of us who is listening to these words right now, be assisted and uplifted and protected, connected to spirit 
so that each of us may open the mystic doors to healing and illumination. And if you are game, if you are saying yes to that, if you, uh, if you agree with what I just said, please say a ho, amen, 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 yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Amen. And because the first prayers and intentions act like a compass, really like a compass that direct and correct us on this new journey, please take a moment right now with you to reflect on what your intentions are for this work together. T.S. Eliot writes, in my beginning is my end. And all the mystics agree that implicit in our first Beginnings on a journey, in our first inklings, our first desires reside the trajectory of the entire journey. So uh, next slide. Okay, everybody. So uh, just take a moment, well, very briefly, just uh, you, this may come very quickly and it may be something that you want to continue later. What got you to say yes to being here? Why are you here? And what are the questions that you're bringing? What is the healing that you are after in this study. And while you're doing that, I'm going to just launch and say uh, a little bit about who I am and how I came to the work of ancestral healing, which is also intergenerational healing. They're, they're uh, interchangeable terms. Uh, let's, let's start with a dream, actually. Uh, this is a dream from decades ago in the beginning, I think I was in my 20s. I'm walking at night in a strange city and I'm alone on a cobblestone. Old. It's an old city, very old and it's dark. It's like Prague or Warsaw or who knows where, Paris perhaps, but long ago. And I pass on my right a large cathedral or synagogue and it intrigues me and I wanna go in and I can't find my way in. And this place, this, this structure, this gorgeous place, Gothic, is surrounded by a wrought iron fence. Uh, and an iron fence, it's padlocked. It has little spikes all over it. You couldn't climb over it without getting speared. And there's no way to slip between the bars. So I'm feeling kind of dejected and I continue on my way and then, boom. I fall down. I've tripped over an upturned, an upturned cobblestone. And when I level myself, like looking down, trying to get my balance, I see, wait a minute, there's this cobblestone sticking up because something's sticking out beneath the brick. And that's why it was turned up. So what is going on here? I look hard because it's dark and I see not one, but two things sticking out. One is a rolled up manuscript with ancient Hebrew letters written on it. It's almost like a parchment of that's in a scroll. And two, a big tome, a big volume of the collected works of Carl Jung. Now I won't go into these symbols just to say, because we could just un keep unpacking that and they're kind of hilarious, but uh, this is what we call a map dream. This came at a time of life where I didn't know where I was going. I was walking in the dark night of my soul. And I couldn't get into the institutional religion that I had been raised in. I had a huge spiritual hunger. I couldn't go the normal route. It was because of um, so many reasons, patriarchal norms and being a woman and being, it was just, I, it, I just couldn't get in. And this dream told me what was coming. It told me that I would be studying Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, and I would be, be, begin an in-depth study of Carl Jung and, and analytical psychology, depth psychology. The main point here is not me, but it's you. If you study your dreams, you will most likely find that you too have map dreams, or maybe they don't come in dreams, but you do. All of us have signposts on the path of life because stored in 
all of our unconscious minds are the sacred possibilities and directions that our lives can take. Now, I call these the breadcrumbs that are sprinkled by psyche on our life's path. They lead to wholeness. They lead to our sacred purpose. They lead to that which we said yes to come to planet Earth on this in this lifetime. So I begin with that because well, that leads into our teaching for tonight. Why this course and why now? Each one of us has a story that led us to this work, to the ancestral healing work, also called the intergenerational trauma healing work. And my personal story has to do with being a second generation Holocaust survivor. My mother escaped Nazi Germany in 1939 as a teenager. She never told me or my siblings that scores of her cousins, uncles, and aunts uh, were all murdered. She knew that, but she did never talk about it until uh, for decades later, I didn't know. And this was kept all below the surface. Another secret I was raised with was that my father, who was an American kid from Brooklyn, uh, what the secrets he kept from World War II, these secrets were no secret at all because they came out in his temper and they they came out in my mother's milk, so to speak. They came out in their rigid politics and their gripping parental style. But as my quest took me far away from them because I tried to leave as early as I could get out of their house uh, to escape their patterns and to heal from them, I inadvertently went right back into the study of psychology, which would help me know and connect the dots. And that's what this course is all about, is connecting the dots. Oh, God, of course, when I saw the photographs that my father had taken in uh, Bergen-Belsen upon its liberation, he was there uh, as the British were liberating that death camp. And I didn't know that until after he died and I cleaned out his file cabinet and saw what he had seen, the things that he, the unseeable things that he had seen. And he snapped photographs and there they were. And I connected the dots and thought, that's why he was so crazy. That's why he was so rigid. That's why he was so angry and gripping. I was raised by trauma survivors. What I grew up with were the classic hallmarks of trauma that we will will learn tonight. And I could begin to heal because I could understand. I could begin to heal myself and help others heal. And we will get to all of this shortly. The primer for this course, now in paperback, is a book that is entitled, the same title of this as this course, Wounds into Wisdom, Healing Intergenerational Jewish Trauma. It will greatly add to your learning. I, I hope you'll get it because uh, we'll be drawing from the amazing stories and research in that book, uh, and it'll assist you. Uh, and it has a beautiful study guide. It has a beautiful foreword by my friend and beloved teacher, Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, and just please know that even though my study and research and stories are anchored in my culture, uh, it has become very, very clear with the virtual explosion of interest in ancestral healing and intergenerational healing around the world that uh, these are not Jewish stories. These are global stories. Every ethnicity and every lineage on the face of the earth is doing this work, must be doing this work now. Okay, with that, let's take a breath and go to the next slide. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Carl Jung, the privilege of a lifetime is to become who we truly are. We are already that being latently. We just have to bring it into manifestation. And before we begin talking about trauma, I want to set out an understanding of the wholeness and the health that underpins all of this work. The understanding is that buried beneath the outer layers of our identity, which may be fractured, it may be, we may have suffered profound wounds or our parents did, or our things have happened to us or our families, um, but 
those are the outer layers at the inside. We are all, we're whole. And, um, and been there, buried beneath the outer layers of our identity, however fractured they may be, is the secret code of our potential. The secret code of our potential. And each one of us has a, this code. I call it the soul's code. Next slide, Vince. Thank you. Plato and many depth psychologists who came after him describe this secret code as a small nugget of potency. A small nugget of potency. Plato said that just as every acorn is embedded with a picture, a little uh, kind of mystic picture of its full potential encoded into it, uh, and the full potential of a vast oak tree, like you see here, a deeply rooted oak tree, if all the conditions are right, so each and every one of us is embedded with a code. The soul's code is a picture of what we might be by the end of a long and ripe life, a picture of our own uniqueness, a picture of our own unique gifts, and what we might become if all the conditions are right. Um, well, you might be saying, are you crazy lady? There's 8 billion of us on the planet right now. How, how the heck is that possible that each and every one of us has our own uniqueness, our own purpose, our own sacred purpose? That's like a fairy tale. But then why does every mystical tradition on the face of earth teach that there are no two beings alike, that each one of us has our own fingerprints, each one of us has our own soul signature, each one of us is a unique facet of this, this anima mundi, the, 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 the world soul of the divine, an expression. Each one of us is an expression of the divine encoded with an inherent image of what we might become. And, and I mean, I want to underscore might. If we seize the moment, if we seize the moment, if we do our work, if all the conditions are uh, allowing, if we get the self-care we need, if we have the resources that we need, if we have the teachers, if we pray and things fall into place and we listen to the dreams and the synchronicities and pick up the breadcrumbs and follow the, follow the guidance, our being here on this journey, I believe, is about this about this coming into our own fruition. It's about seizing the moment. And um, I know that this is true for Carolyn's teachings as well. They're about the flowering of our souls into our individuality. Jung called it our individuated selves. So uh, let me let me share with you a word that I love. Next slide. And that word is entelechy, the vital principle within each one of us and all organisms that guides its development, guides our development toward a specified end. This is a term that Aristotle used to describe this magnetic draw to our purpose, to achieving our purpose, to achieving our wholeness, our, our fulfillment, that's already encoded in us, like the acorn has a picture of the, of the vast oak tree, this tiny little thing, we too have that. And um, I, I would say that uh, all the, so many traditions in the world uh, name this guiding power, this magnetic force. I think the Romans called it the genius within us. The Greeks called it the daemon. The Christians have called it the oversoul or the guardian angel. I love, in particular, I love Thomas Merton who called it the hidden wholeness, our hidden wholeness, that each one of us has a hidden wholeness. Denise Levertov, a favorite poet of mine, calls it the quiet mystery. Next slide. Whatever we call this magnetic pull, what is true is that our soul's code has a draw on us that plays upon our lives and calls us forward to our individuated nature. Um, 
Jung called it the irresistible compulsion and urge to become what one is. Yeah, next slide. So how do we attune to this draw? How do we listen for that call? And especially now, next slide, especially now, because uh, the, the, the distracting forces of the world are so powerful. They pull us out of our center. And this is a picture of my desk. Just joking. It, it's worse than that, I guarantee you. Um, late at night, pulled in so many directions. But what do we do? How do we keep coming back to that centripetal force, that internal knowing, that inner, that inner spark, that that column at the at the core of us? And we come together in community. We come together to study, like in courses like this. We have sacred practices of all kinds, and. And by the way, this is an advertisement, um, next slide, to create intentional time and space while we're on this journey together, please do create, uh, create some moments every day if you can. Intentional time and space, here is a picture of my altar, um, but you create your own altar. And uh, I'd love to hear from you, maybe on the Facebook community page for this, for this class how you personally carve out your inner landscape. How do you do that? How do you, what works for you? Because for each one of us, there's a different way. How do you rebalance yourself? How do you get your nervous system back with this world that is so tumultuous? Um, the well, Elder Testament, the Old Testament said, listen, how do we listen to the still small voice of the self? So is it a notebook near one's bed or a space to sit and contemplate uh, an ancestral altar, a, a favorite chair? Um, these practices of self-care and self-calming are all critical for us now. I don't think that they're optional anymore as ratcheted up as the world is because when we steady and cool our nervous systems, we can do remarkable feats of healing which is why we'll be spending time with our embodied practices and techniques. So next slide. Why is this so important at this current moment? Uh, no, this is not 1954 and no, this is not 1922. And this is, this is 2023 and the heat is on, the heat is on. Why is this so critical at this current moment? Next slide, because of this beautiful being, this beautiful being here, this beautiful creation that we live on. This, we call it the anima mundi, the world soul, the soul of the world. The ancients understood that mother earth herself had a soul and each of our souls is connected to her and the work we do on ourselves and our families to heal ourselves affect her, heal her, and heal each other because we're all connected through her. Back to me, Vince. And how are we doing on our video? Are we doing okay? Yeah, all is well. Great. Okay. So much of what we are seeing in the world today is, and why, why is intergenerational healing, ancestral healing, the hot thing? It's not just because it's a hot trend. I promise you not. Uh, it is because today there is a snowballing effect of centuries of unworked trauma, unmetabolized trauma that's coming due. It's like this snowballing, 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 and it is all coming due. It's like the not only the environment is getting hotter, but humanity is seething with heat because of all of these unworked historical traumas, deferred pain, deferred grief, um, all the collective injust, personal and collective injustices, uh, the traumas of discrimination that have gone unmetabolized or have been stored as it were under the skin in the cellular memory of humanity. So I'm speaking about things that all of us know. This is uh, really 
generations crushing cultures of the indigenous around the world, um, black people and people of color, the, the, the uh, incredible discrimination that they live with, the humiliations and women, women, uh, what the, the patriarchal abuses of, 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 the, of this gender for literally thousands of years. So we might wish that all of these trauma residues would evaporate and just go away with time, but it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. They're all stored in the collective unconscious. And as we'll see shortly, our trauma residue persists. It affects our health. It affects our joy. It affects our appetite for life. It acts like an eclipsing quality on, on our vitality. And not only our vitality, but passing down to future generations. And that's the second reason why this work is coming due now. Uh, and it's in the forefront in all kinds of mainstream uh, magazines and newspapers because of the field of epigenetics. The research coming out of clinics now, of the clinical trials and uh, studies that are from animals as well as humans, the data shows that there is uh, that there is a residue that is from environmental traumas, from all kinds of stresses. When it's not metabolized, it literally changes our physiology. And that is passed. Those changes are passed to oncoming generations. So what our grandparents lived through is in us. It's, uh, it, and we'll go into all of this, but let's take a moment right now. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty in this course. Let's, um, let's take a, a, a sip of water or tea. And uh, let's take a moment here to jot down your thoughts, your questions, stream of consciousness is fine. Don't worry about uh, making sentences. Just what's coming up for you? as we start to, to land on this topic. Catch your breath, press the enter button, and then we'll take a look at what science says about all of this. Okay, please continue to write. We'll go on and you'll have these slides to refer back to. So we know that trauma occurs biologically, yet it affects us at all levels of our being. And the new field of epigenetics tells us what we, many of us have been intuiting for years that the trauma that isn't faced, the traumas that haven't been metabolized or, or worked through has residues that are transmitted intergenerationally. So the book that I'm recommending, Wounds into Wisdom, is filled with stories of people who did the work, who did the hard work uh, and worked through the tragedies of their lives. They're from all over the world. Uh, both tragedies and traumas from their own lives as well as those that they've inherited and um, and how these legacies of anxiety and fear and shame can be passed on, but they can be transmuted, they can be transformed and that changes their lives, it changes their children's lives. So um, I think I'm gonna tell uh, another dream as it, as it comes out to be. This is uh, somebody that I worked with in research, someone in, from my research. Uh, it's She is not in the book. Um, her story is just almost threw me off my chair when I heard it. She said that the very first memory that she had in this lifetime was a dream, a nightmare that came recurrent again and again. And in 
well, finally, she was three or four years old. And I'll tell you the dream in a moment. Uh, her mother each night would rush in and comfort her and rock her and soothe her and put her back in her crib. Well, finally, she gets big enough to tell her mother what she's been dreaming. As her mother is holding her and rocking her, she begins to articulate the story that keeps repeating. And the story is this. She is watching as if from on high, a man at a train station in an old town he jumps from the platform into the tracks or onto the tracks of a train just as the train is departing. And he's running and running and running and running after the train and he can't catch up. And he's very, very upset and he's crying and he's yelling and he's begging, please stop, stop, stop. And he can't catch up and the train takes off and leaves him behind. Okay, well, she finally articulates that story and her mother starts to cry. And her mother says, how could you know that story? There's no way that you could know that story. We never told you that story. That's the story of your grandfather who was in the war. And he came home one day having gotten food from the black market for his family. The door is open. His family is all gone. His Gentile neighbors say, hurry, get to the train station. All the Jews have been taken away. And he runs to the train station. He jumps from the platform into the tracks. He sees the train leaving and he's running and running and running. And he never caught up. His family was erased. He lived and he started a new family. But that traumatic memory lived in him and transferred somehow, and we do not have the science for this, but somehow transferred to this young girl. By the time she gave her testimony, she was already a millennial. She was in her uh, early thirties and she was a very bright young woman and she sought help. She went to a three gen Holocaust survivors network and she belonged to a group of other young people who whose grandparents had all gone through this. And she told me something remarkable because I was so blown away by this dream, by how could you inherit your father's, your grandfather's dream? It just didn't make sense, like to the details. And she said that actually wasn't unusual at all in this group of three gen survivors. So many of us had our grandparents' dreams. So I give you that, I give you that, uh, that dream as a, as a way of saying that we are embedded. Uh, those, those memories linger in us. They imprint our psyches deeply. They pass on, often skipping a generation, coming to us, and then they're ours to deal with, and we must deal with them. Okay, let's take a big breath and a drink. Please jot down your thoughts as we go. And then we'll go look at some definitions so that we'll, we're all on the same page. We'll go to the next slide, Vince, please. So trauma comes from the Greek word wound. It's the residue of any deeply distressing life experience that overwhelms our capacity to cope. And as my colleague Resma Menachem says, trauma is anything the body perceives as too much, too fast, too soon. Next slide. And there's also what we know now is collective trauma. And that's an event or series of events that shatters the experience of safety for not one, but an entire group or groups of people. Uh, Dr. Leah Salzman says, collective trauma is a shared experience that alters the narrative and psyche of a group or community. You can think about uh, my community is the Jewish community, but you may be from an indigenous uh, background. You may be from people of color who have a, a very rich background who have suffered 
uh, discrimination. You may be from any part of the world. You know what this collective trauma is about. We'll go to the next slide. Intergenerational trauma. Now we're honing in on what we're here about. Intergenerational trauma is the unhealed residue of extreme life experiences that are transferred, that is transferred to future generations. Chemi Shalev is a journalist for Haaretz in Israel. Uh, he says, I am a Jew and there are scenes of the Holocaust that are indelibly etched in my mind, even though I was not alive at the time. Think about that for a moment. Um, yeah, whether you're an individual who has suffered an accident or sudden death or some kind of violation, or we're talking about an entire people, um, there are, for all of us, the same kinds of experiences. And these are hallmarks of trauma that are really important. They're very, very useful and helpful to know them. So we can identify them in ourselves and in others and start to connect the dots. When I learn these, we'll go to the next slide. These, uh, the, the four hallmarks of trauma, that's when all the lights started coming on about my childhood. I'll go to the first one whether we're talking about individual trauma or family trauma, collective trauma, whoops, now let's stay on the first one for just a moment. Dissociation is paramount. It is the universal. And dissociation is a survival mechanism that helps us stay grounded. I remember once a, a mo there was a motorcycle accident right outside my door and this young man wasn't wearing a helmet. Uh, I run out into the street, there's blood everywhere. I was completely freaked out, but I felt my body knowing exactly what to do. It put this on hold so that I could keep my wits about me and call 911. And the ambulance came and, it, and you know, I, I could be there with that young man, as he said, oh, my father is going to kill me. <laughs> you know? um, I said, don't worry about it. Your dad isn't going to, he'll be glad you're alive. Um, but that is the, a survival mechanism that we all know to numb ourselves emotionally until later. The problem is with dissociation, the later sometimes doesn't come. Sometimes we have shelved our alarm and our feelings and the sights that we've seen, the odiousness of, of what we take in the camera, we, we put that into the file cabinet and we divest ourselves from it for years and decades. And sometimes we never process those, those memories. That becomes a move from a life-saving mechanism to a life-threatening mechanism. So all of these are the, in the same camp. They're all to save our lives initially, but then um, if they're not worked with, if they're not integrated, these very hallmarks can become life-threatening. Now we'll go to the next one. And this one, I'm sure uh, you also know people, maybe you yourself have experienced this. Uh, there's a hyper arousal. We have stress hormones going through our systems and we are ready for that shoe to drop at any moment. And we are furious if you look at me the wrong way. And we go from zero to 10, like boom, like that. There is no, there's no, it's just an on and off switch. We just uh, are so uh, at a boiling point at any moment. And that attributes, that, that contributes to road rage and it contributes to violence on the streets and it continue it, it, it and to contributes to uh domestic violence and our our trauma inside has not been worked and our nervous system is continuously in what we call sympathetic nervous system uh channel and so we are ready to hit and we're ready to smite we're don't look at me like that don't talk to me like that that is a trauma residue that's something that i grew up with um, took me years of yoga, massage, deep breathing, Reikian work, depth psychology, you know, 
uh, uh, decades, decades to understand how to ratchet back my nervous system. And still I am, I have that inside of me. I have to work it. So hyper arousal. By the way, as we go through these, I'm sure you're taking your journaling and what are the ones that you were raised with? Were you raised in a psychically numb household or were you raised in a hyper reactive household uh, or were, were your people very, very calm? Next, we'll go to toxic shame and isolation. By the way, there is such a thing as appropriate shame. Um, we'll talk about that sometime, but for now, just to say that trauma often leaves us in shame and shame leaves us isolated. If I have been violated myself, God forbid, I feel somehow it's just, it's just, it's just natural to feel that some, I did something wrong. There's something wrong with me. And I go into my cave and look, lick my wounds and, um, and I, can heal there, but if I stay in my cave for too long, not good, right? I get isolated. I become a shame, a shamed person. Same thing with hyper arousal. We need to be aroused and and vigilant in case that tiger is really going to catch up with us, but not when we're at the dinner table, right? So it's it's how we process these things, each of these four hallmarks. And now we go to the most quizzical one of all, the most curious one, the tendency to re repeat or reenact trauma on ourselves or on others. That's a big one. And as you read Wounds into Wisdom, there are amazing uh, stories about about how this happens. Why is it that hurt people hurt people? Why is it that abused children often, often grow up and abuse others or themselves? Uh, why is it that, uh, that people who have been traumatized at war, in war, will sign up again and again for another round of duty when they don't have to? So all of that, these are, this is very, very curious material, but we know that from uh, clinical experience that these are true, from all the traumatologists in the world agree that these are, these are the, uh, the hallmarks of, of trauma. So we'll take a breath right now. If you wanna jot anything in your journal, please do, about how, what are the dots that are, being connected for you right now. Uh, what do you relate to out of this list of four? What do you know about personally and what did you, what were you raised with in your upbringing? And there is really, really good news <laughs> about the capacity to heal. So let's, uh, begin now just to talk about this field of epigenetics. This is, uh, let me say before Vince turns the slide, um, this is where you can get glassy eyed. We just have a few scientific, a little bit more scientific slides. Don't worry about that. You'll get the general meaning is inside you. It's not on the slide, but we, I wanna share with you a little bit about, uh, about epigenetics now. So first of all, next slide the simplest definition possible of genes. What are genes? They're the, the building blocks that transmit characteristics from parent to child, right? They're the blueprint in any organism that carries the parent's characteristic to the child, like blue eyes or brown eyes, straight or curly hair, musical abilities or athletic abilities. What's most important for us here is uh, the genes don't change, but the gene expression changes when we are traumatized. And that is governed by the next slide. There we go. The science of epigenetics. Epi meaning above the genes or on top of the genes, the filaments that cover the genes, and genes are the carriers 
of hereditary information. So the science of epigenetics is, if you, if, is basically how unprocessed trauma passes from generation to generation. When they say stresses, heritable stresses, that means uh, traumas, dramas and traumas that haven't been worked through, how they pass from a grandparent to parent to you to your children. And that's, it's the study of all of that. So if I grow up in a household, for instance, where there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to eat, and I have two little siblings and I'm foraging to help, to help all of us, that's going to affect you. That's going to affect your gene expression. If I grow up and there's a war outside, there are bombs falling, there will likely be effects on my, above and on my DNA strands, epigenetic changes that affect how my genes express themselves. Next slide. And it's through the workings of the epigenetics that genes are activated or deactivated, emphasized or hushed. In other words, in simple words, epigenetics affect how our genes work, uh, how our genes translate. Our genes are affected by what's going on around and how then they express themselves. So the main point is here, very, very importantly, um, epigenetic changes to my DNA are reversible. Uh, they can be changed with the work I do on myself. Now, genes don't change. They just don't change. But it's how genes express themselves that they're changed. They can be squashed. They can be. So my, res my, my uh, genetic ability to be resilient can get squashed because I have so much PTSD. Uh, but I can work on that so that my resilience comes back. All right. Okay. Back to me. Um, I lost my screen. There we go. Thanks. So, so what all this means is that epigenetic mechanisms takes the messages from the world, takes the traumas from the world and translates it to the genes and changes the gene function. So a great deal of stress when I'm growing up, for instance, might translate into like I just said, lower resilience or a lower IQ, a shorter lifespan. And by the way, these studies bear out racially the stresses, the stress and inflammation that happens for a person of color in my country and the United States is so much vaster, so much greater, um, affecting the epigenetic transmissions of perfectly good genes uh, on, these, on, on people. Uh, so that their mortality rate is uh, is higher, their resilience level is lower, et cetera. Um, and this is important. So this is where our work comes in. Um, what all the great traumatologists and all the great neuroscientists agree upon is one factor, one factor that changes our ancestral trauma transmission, the transmission of 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 trauma through the generations, and that is awareness. I'm gonna say it again, there's one factor that they all agree on, and it's awareness. Bringing light, bringing the light of awareness to bear on our systems, and what we are carrying, and what we inherited, and what we are going through. That's when change begins, awareness. So. That is the good news. That is why we're here. That is what we're doing. That is what Carolyn does in all of her courses. That is what I'm doing in all of my teaching is, is trying to bring awareness, the light of awareness onto what it is that we are carrying, what our trauma legacies are, as well as our positive legacies. Let's go to the next slide. This is our last slide for a while. And this is um, one of the greats uh, I think she was originally Israeli. Uh, yeah, Ail Danielli now lives in uh, in New York. Uh, she one of the great, great traumatologists. Collective, she talks about collective intergenerational trauma in in all around the world. Awareness of transmitted intergenerational trauma 
processes will inhibit pathology to succeeding generations. Now, this is a scientist saying this. This is a, a new ager. She's saying that awareness of what is being transmitted through the generations will inhibit the transmissions. We need to just like, oh, okay, connect those dots. Connect the dots, have those ahas, have that awakening. Okay, back to me. <laughs> Thank you for your wonderful attention, everybody. You may be buzzing. Hopefully there's some dots that are connecting in your own life and your about your family, your lineage. Um, and we will pick up the question of, like the question, in what ways are you being influenced by your ancestors' history and legacies today? That's a big question. In what ways are you personally being influenced? And maybe your children uh, or grandchildren are being influenced by your ancestors' histories and legacies today. And we're going to pick that up in module two and begin to apply this and make it personal and experiential and open up uh, to the ancestral realm, literally in our experiential guided meditations, guided imaginal exercises, um, which are not, which are real. These going to the invisible realms ourselves. But for now, for now, it's ultra important to create this protective container. And as we started out by saying, and that means that before journeying into these dimensions, the ancestral dimensions, we are safe and embodied, that we're in a state of deep harmony with ourselves. So I hope you're drinking with me and scribbling. Therefore, let's come full circle now to where we began. The end is in the beginning with a brief journey. And in this journey, would you please sit back again and feel, feel that delicious relaxation in the back of your body. I'm going to uh, say some things to you as if you are saying them to yourself for affirmations. And I want you to just notice, let the words come in, bathe in these words, and then notice what happens. Some of them will be, oh yeah, sure, that's delicious. I know that one. And some of them will be more at your edge. It'll be like more uncomfortable. And that's for a reason, okay? Um, so having said that, let's sit back now and feel, feel your back body again, slowly and gently. <sighs> Let your breath return to your body after that big load. You're figuratively pressing the enter button all of this will integrate in its own time. And slowly let that little spark rise and fall again from your, from your lower back, rising up with every inhalation and falling again down to your low back. And every time it rises and falls, it illuminates and carves out that passageway, that interior core channel at the center of you. It passes behind your organs So you can relax your belly and all of your organs. It passes behind your heart and lungs. You can sit back and relax a little bit deeper. It passes behind your throat. and moves to the very center of your skull, illuminating your brain, illuminating your mind so that you're, you can imagine your brain shining like a luminous crystal. It 
So as you continue to relax and follow my voice, four affirmations are going to come your way. And let them in as if my voice were your voice. Just try them on. And like I said, tr see which ones, which of the four are easy and which, where your edge is. The first one is, I accept myself as I am for who I am. I accept myself as I am for who I am. This goes back to that discussion about our uniqueness, our own particularity. Can you say this sta statement and really mean it? I accept myself as I am for who I am. I honor myself for coming into the world to fulfill my sacred purpose. I honor myself for coming into the world to fulfill my unique sacred purpose, which is also called in by the Buddhists, my Dharma. by the Kabbalists, my tikkun. I truly honor myself for coming into the world to fulfill my unique sacred purpose, my tikkun, my dharma. Just noticing as these words come to you, noticing how comfortable or uncomfortable they are. Third one, I forgive myself. I forgive myself for my humanness, my limitations, my mistakes. I forgive myself for my humanness, my limitations, my mistakes. Feel your way into that affirmation. I forgive myself for my humanness, my limitations, and my mistakes. And finally, I envelop myself now in self-love. I envelop myself now in self-love. Take a moment with these. We'll take a moment just to be quiet and notice what happened for you. If you'd like to jot anything in your journal, that would be great. Or just muse about them. Beautiful. It's a joy to be here with all of you. And as I said 
uh, next module, module two, we'll be taking this work and starting to apply it to ourselves, to our families. We'll always be referring backwards and integrating um, to include and transcend, as they say. So um, thank you. Please, uh, I, I will say one more thing, and then I'd love to uh, be joined by Carolyn. Um, you got a Facebook link today in your email, um, and that will not change for, I understand, for the uh, for all of our time together. I would love to hear from you there. I would love to hear your thoughts, your questions, your musings, your best practices. Sh let's share with each other. I will try to do my best to answer questions there. Um, and um, yeah, that's a, it's a great forum. And uh, I hear from Carolyn's team that is completely confidential. No one else sees that but our group. So I hope that you will tag each other and find friends and find me. Okay. Um, Vince, we're ready to bring Carolyn on. Oh, yum. <laughs> it's my first response is, oh, yum. And, and now I have a thousand other things that I just want to talk to you about so everyone else can listen. Great. You know, when uh, every, you know, uh, so much of what you are teaching, I, I feel like in my own life, um, in my own work, I see the points of validation because where there's truth, there's truth. I mean, mm -hmm. a long time ago, I started to teach that our biography becomes our biology. So how can our biography not change our biology, which is exactly what you're talking about with the DNA structure and how that, in fact, is uh, if we're conscious beings, then our the consciousness of our yeah. biographies collectively together have yeah. to influence. And as we, as each of us gains or loses light, depending on how we live our lives, that that affects the the sparks on the DNA circuit. It, it, it just, I mean, it's just so, it's so ridiculously obvious how, how structured and how um, <clears throat> logical, how, or how divine organics are everywhere. It's you know, really true. It's just the nature of di organic divinity. It's just, God in our blood and bones and God in the cycles of life and God in there. We don't need huge apparitions. It's, it's everywhere. It's hidden in, in the obvious, but something you said that was so, I know that I believe I shouldn't say that, but I deeply believe that we are living at a time unlike any other. And I'm sure there were times and other times in history, I mean, maybe someone could have said that in 1939 and someone could have said that in 1917 in Moscow and et cetera, et cetera. But the ingredients of what makes this present moment so extraordinary have never, have never existed before. We're on, we're on the verge of entering a planetary community. Every single species, every single everything of life is participating in a do or die transformation. Either we're going to make it together or we're not. This is a time when, you know, species are evaporating and new species are trying to be born. And this is a time when it is the end of the Abrahamic traditions as we know them so that the middle, the middle image of of the God is man is going to fade away and be replaced by a bio-spiritual ecological system in which God is law. And what you're talking about is the law in our bones and blood. Mm. You see, because law is universal and can transfer from planet to planet. And it's the end of our earth-based gods that look like us, behave like us, and promise us deals down here. <laughs> but instead, 
we have to shift to a transition of a bio-spiritual ecological theology where all the great mystical, the teachings of all the great, the mystical teachings, not the religious, the mystical jewels of all the great teachings will survive this transition. But mm -hmm. here's what I want, what you're talking about is in the traditions, as you know, there is something like the potlatch dinner in the Inuits, the when someone reaches reaches the end of their life or the last rites, the that there are there are and I don't like rituals. There are recognized rituals that a soul, in order to move on, needs to gather itself. It needs to complete its life as consciously as it's as is possible. And that is what the last rites are about. That is what a confession is about. That is what the potlatch dinner is about, where you give away everything so you have time between you and the spirit. to You give away, if you have a song that you haven't finished, you find someone who can finish the song so part of you doesn't stay behind. Right. And my point is, collectively, we are undergoing this type of archetypal drama. Uh -huh. Cheers. collectively ah it is the collect so you in your language you're saying all these wounds are coming up yeah all of this this is what it's like before we can make the passage mm, mm. to this next stage of our own life and our own what our own potential to to becoming um dwellers on planet earth instead of residents of tiny towns mm -hmm. and where we can become members of a humanity instead of a nationality where mm -hmm. we can make this transition to being part of a species instead of a, a sexuality issue and a religion and a political party and all this nonsense all the wounds that have been the, the many many now, it's not all the wounds, but how we've used all that to destroy each other. Yeah. This is this is the piper. The, we're paying that piper now. We have got to go. That's why all these wounds are coming up. And I'm convinced part of the madness in people that they can't identify mm -hmm. is this psychic. Uh, part of the fear people have part of the it's like a collective sense that the atmosphere is pregnant with catastrophe, but where is it? Mm -hmm. Where is it? We make movies of doom, of doom and catastrophes impending. We want to escape the planet because something bad is coming. <laughs> but um, what I think we're sensing is that we must confront the parts of ourselves, the way in which we, we have lived, and all the damage that has been done so we don't take that with us. Mm. And we will, none of us live to see it, but we are in the throes and the beginnings of that. That is why there's such an emphasis in every person to heal. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it is a, uh, <laughs> the 11th hour. It truly is. And we're doing, uh, some of us, mm -hmm. some of us are doing, as, are, are, are working as fast as we can and as deep as we can. And others are wreaking havoc mm -hmm. um, and wreaking more havoc. So, you know, I don't need to, to go into that. But I, I, I think that there's something you're saying that's so interesting that we're, uh, that all these wounds are coming up now before we can make this yes. passage passage into the next life, yes. into the next era, into the next eon. And our humanity, into our next design. We are actually programming the DNA for our next design. And I think it's in our own interest to not take our hostility with us to not take our vengeance with us. Of course, I'm idealizing as if I was a fiction author, but what well, I am saying is that we, we have to lose our appetite to kill the way we have it. To think that destroying each other is the solution to our problems. That if there's, you know, if we don't have enough money in the budget, well, let's just 
you know, bomb a country. We let's just do this. Let's just kill humans because that's the solution to everything that we've ever done. We uh, and and what I'm saying is that that is that fourth hallmark of of trauma is that proclivity to keep that cycle going of destruction. Right. It comes through us, and we have to we reenact. It's a reenactment of the trauma on ourselves. On I mean, the suicide rates, the homicide rates, uh, we are destroying, we are destroying. And now you and I, and probably everyone who's listening to us are, are, are thinking, yes, let's make that passage. Let's, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's do the dark, you know, the, the, uh, sort of the, the metabolize that those heavy legacies so that we can, we can go into the next echelons uh, of life and to the next, and to, and, and as you said, to be part of a species, um, how do we, how do we clue the rest of humanity who's at war in on this pro project? You know That's what? the question. Honestly, as I mean, I'm sure you, you've dwelled on that in your prayers as, as often and as much as I have. And I've really come to the conclusion that, um, the best gift we can give is to become fully authentic in what we're doing mm -hmm. and what we're teaching and release it to as many people as we can and hands off the consequences. I, I, I don't even yeah. know how heaven works behind the scenes, but I deeply know that it does. And that um, messages of grace reach people. Mm -hmm. Messages of humanity reach people that, um, and, and I, and I, I remember the answer that was given one time and someone asked from my tradition, they have, um, the Carmelite nuns who are cloistered nuns. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, you know, why would anybody, what are they doing in there? <laughs> what are they doing in there? And the response was praying for people who don't pray for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, you know what? And of course, I went to a Carmelite convent near me that opened up way back, and I was I was eight years old. It was the only day it would be open, and after that, it would be sealed to the public. Mm -hmm. And I remember every step and every breath I took in that place. Every single thing about it is absolutely sealed in my mind, imprinted deeply, and the thought that somebody would be called into prayer. And I cannot tell you how many times, how many times I have been disrupted in my thoughts about the world. And whoosh, I'm back in that Carmelite convent and in a, this micro image, realizing that people who do good things and who pray, it, it is like, it's like the antidote to the psychic free radicals that people generate with their negativity. Yeah. It it offsets that. And in that in uh, and everything that we do to help others heal communicates that healing I think to the collective DNA to the to that map that that we are made of that we share. Because it can't be, it can't be otherwise. That's right. Energy comes before matter. It's, this is how our bio spiritual ecology works. We we have that imprint of all hum humanity in us. It can't be otherwise. It just can't. Well, nothing evaporates. Nothing. Precisely. And uh, it's all in the neosphere, as as was it. Teilhard that said, you know, it's all imprinted in all of us and it is kept in the world wide web. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's our contemporary language for what Chardin would say. It is, it is in the sphere. That's right. Of all beings. It is just so that's, and I, that's why I cannot tell you how timely and wonderful I think your class is and what a magnificent teacher you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a delight to be here. Um, and, and I'm so excited to, to, to teach with you and to talk to you, converse with you and, and to hear what our students are saying. 
Well, what skills they will a a bunch. So thank God they're a chatty bunch. They're wonderful, wonderful. I'm so blessed, so blessed with the students in this platform. And I and I think because for now that I've, I've been teaching, we, David and I have had CMED for decades now, but the but we've always wanted to present programs that have to do with healing, with spirituality, with transformation, with this message of always making yourself better <clears throat> so that you can make the world better. You know, so that we can make the world a better place together. Amen. Amen to that. Your next class is Mapping Our Family Legacies. We're going to start the work. All right. Well, that works for me. That will be our next class. And with that, I want to thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And we will see you for class two in a few days. Thank you.